Hello and welcome to People's History Museum's Evening with Heart and Parcel online. I'm Zosha and I'm Programme Officer at People's History Museum, which is the National Museum of Democracy and home of ideas worth fighting for in Manchester. Whilst we're all taking important steps and collective action to defeat COVID-19, People's History Museum has been working hard to bring people together to inspire hope, positivity and action. And that's the aim of our programme every year. This year, our programme is exploring the theme of migration and it's been co-created with the community programme team, which is made up of six people whose lives have been shaped by migration. So we're really excited to be bringing you this evening um, a night with Heart and Parcel. So Heart and Parcel um, were founded in 2015 by Claire and Carolina to bring women together from migrant communities across Greater Manchester by making dumplings and developing their English language and communication skills. This evening, you're going to meet Claire and Carolina as they cook and share with you Carolina's pierogi recipe from the Heart and Parcel cookbook, whilst talking about the importance of the dumpling making process through their work and a bit more about their fundraising cookbook, which showcases the recipes from the women who access their English and cooking classes. So before I hand over, just a bit of housekeeping. This event is a live stream hosted on YouTube. If you'd like to ask any questions or interact with us throughout, you can use the live chat box next to the video. You'll need to have a Gmail or YouTube account for this. Carolina will be answering any questions or technical questions about the pierogies. Um, and I'll be saving all your other questions for a Q&A at the end. And just a reminder that all comments can be seen by all viewers and hosts. So I'll hand over to Claire and Carolina. Hello everyone. Thank you Zosha for introducing us. Okay, go. Hello everyone. Zosha, thank you so much for introducing us and thank you so much to People's History Museum for um, for giving us that opportunity to, to, to show what we do and to talk about our book and our project. Um, we will be cooking Polish dumplings, uh, pierogi tonight, and we will have a Polish site as well, both very traditional, very Polish. And um, I'm really proud to introduce Claire. Uh, she will be, uh, which is unusual, she will be cooking uh, my recipe tonight. <laughs> This is only because of the COVID uh, limitations and all the equipment and cameraman are in closed house. So uh, that's why she will be she will be doing that. But uh, don't worry, I'm really confident she's gonna do very well. <laughs> she's she has seen that many many times me making uh, dumplings and we did our rehearsal last week as well. So I'm I'm pretty sure she will do well. And if not, I will be there correct her or to tell her of. Um, so we will be taking you through the recipe uh, from the beginning to the end, but also we will be uh, chatting about uh, our project, who we are, who we are, what we do. Um, and I also will be in uh, uh, live chat. So uh, if you've got any questions I will, uh, about, about the dumplings, about the project, I will try to answer them. If not, there will be time for questions and answer at the end. So now uh, we hand you over to Claire. Good luck, Claire. <laughs> oh, thank you so much, Carolina. And hello, everybody, and welcome. Thank you so much for um, tuning in tonight. Um, we're going to start first with a little activity. Um, because actually these live stream uh, sessions are exactly as you see, it's the same setup that we do for our students. So what we do is we um, bring, as Lucia said, we bring migrant women together to practice English and fold dumplings or cook lots of different recipes. And when COVID-19 happened, we moved everything online. So I'm just gonna give you a bit of a flavor about what the students um, experience when they come into our English language classes. And it's usually to try to connect the ingredients with the English first, just to get them thinking about it. So you guys can join in. Uh, I have a task for you and this task is, I'm going to give you one minute, one minute to name all of the ingredients that you can see on the table. So you can go uh, as really simple as you like, say what you see, you can go a bit further, you can say the colour, the description, the quantity. If you get bored of the ingredients, you can go on to the utensils, just say as much as you can. You can type in the live chat. 
Um, or you can just speak out loud, it's no problem. No one will mind, I'm sure you're at home, so no one's listening. Uh, or you can just think it in your head. Are you ready? In three, two, one, go. So, try to get as much as possible. Say everything you can. Don't forget the things in the jars, really, really important. If you see anything that you haven't seen before, maybe think about it. Can you say it out loud? What is it? Is there a different name for it, perhaps? Maybe you speak a couple of different languages. Don't forget the things in the jars. Be more specific. Maybe add in a utensil there. 15 seconds. Keep going. Keep adding. Maybe you can have a look at the things that you've already mentioned. Check your spelling. <laughs> if you're sure. There might even be some new things that you've never seen it before in your life. That's absolutely fine. In five, four, three, two, one. Stop. How did you do? <laughs> so usually from this point, we'll then take the ingredients onto the board and then we'll reveal everything. We might check our spelling or go through uh, maybe a bit more information about the different um, uh, ingredients that we've got. Um, but we're not going to do that today. We're going to go straight into the recipe. So I've already got three columns here. And as Carolina said, tonight you're going to be making uh, Carolina's pierogi with the salad. Carolina, can you pronounce that for me? I can't pronounce the salad. Chiquicua. Thank you, Chikpa. And we're going to start. <laughs> <All off. both. laughs> we're going to start off with the filling here. So, what I've got here is um, I've got some onions, and I've been frying these onions, two small white onions. I've chopped them roughly, just in a bit of butter. However, this recipe can be completely adapted for vegans. So, just add the oil and fry for about five to eight minutes till it gets really, really soft. And then um, you're going to need some sauerkraut. So maybe you saw that on the table. Um, I've got the sauerkraut from the Polish shop that Carolina frequents. Where do you where do you normally buy it from, Carolina? Well, I I I got it from Tesco. Tesco's got Polish shelves and uh, sections, so you can uh, you can buy it there. Brilliant, brilliant. Uh, yeah, but so, also. They are everywhere. I think there's like 20 something in Manchester, in Greater Manchester. So it's fine. Yeah, great. Thank you. So what I've done with the sauerkraut just to prepare it is um, Carolina likes to boil it in a little bit of water before for 20 minutes, just on a low heat. And that just takes out the kind of strength of the flavor to get it a bit more subtle. Um, from there, you drain it and squeeze it tightly so all the moisture gets out and then you put it to the side. So I've you noticed I've got 250 there. Um, please feel free to double this completely. Um, pierogi is quite a, let's say, quite a lengthy thing to make. So maybe you want to do everything at once and do a, a big batch so then you can freeze some as well. Um, the next thing I'm going to do is add some mushrooms. I think you saw that on the table too. And the mushrooms, I've just got chestnut mushrooms from the supermarket and I've chopped them finely. I've got 125 grams of those, but if you're doubling the recipe, you can move up to uh, 250. And Carolina's actually got um, quite an interesting note about the mushrooms whilst I fry everything up. Oh, Carolina, I can't hear you. Uh, sorry, sorry. <laughs> so yeah, uh, these are just regular mushrooms and uh, this is for yeah, my mom, she uses them for the sauerkraut and mushroom uh, pierogi, but I think the classic and, and proper way is to use wild mushrooms. So um, in Poland, uh, mushroom picking, it's like, like our national sport. Everyone does it in the, in the season in autumn. And we go to the forest and we do mushroom picking. And then uh, many people save the mushrooms, uh, wild mushrooms. So they, they dry them and they can use them through the whole year for soups and, 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 and sauces and 
pierogi. Um, so yeah, the wild mushroom definitely would be. Uh, I, I'm not sure it's better, but but a different way. They give mm. you that special flavor, that smell. Uh, so, but I think the regular mushrooms are, are fine as well. Great, great. That's really good. So people so can you, find them anywhere. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, you can, you can, you can try both. Yeah. yeah, brilliant. Thank you. So now I'm just frying up the mushrooms together with the onions. Smells really, really good in here. Um, and you're just going to do that for around about two minutes. And you want to add the sauerkraut as well. Just break it up. And this way can get a nice even filling throughout. This is one of the really, really good fillings. It's very versatile. We actually use this in our sessions, don't we, Carolina? Because um, it's vegetarian, it can be vegan as well, and quite a lot of the women have, um, have different dietary requirements. So this is quite nice to have a little um, one yeah. that's accessible and inclusive for everybody, right? Yeah, I think that sauerkraut is also quite exotic for some people and quite interesting. Very popular in Poland, though. Mm. We, we make salad with sauerkraut. We make stews. We make uh, soups. Uh, we really like our <laughs> sauerkraut. <laughs> <laughs> and it, it's healthy. Got, it I think, is. I mean, yeah. But it's got that specific sour taste. Some people don't like it. Kimchi, and also, I mean, I think, right? Pardon, what do you say? Kimchi? Yeah, it's kind of like kimchi as well. Yeah, mm. definitely. I think also I have to remind people that don't, that there's a kind of smell that comes from, from cooking sauerkraut. Don't be put off by it. Everything does taste delicious in the end. <laughs> yeah, I love this smell. It reminds me of my childhood. <laughs> really? Did yeah. your grandmother make this? My grandmother, my mother, but yeah, grandmother, that was my first uh, memory with, yeah, when I think about dumplings, uh, making them with my grandmother for Christmas Eve, because uh, yeah, I didn't mention that uh, mm. before, uh, these specific dumplings are, are very pop popular uh, in Christmas time. So Christmas Eve is very important uh, celebration for us, and we only eat vegetarian and fish dishes that that night. And one of them uh, is pierogi with sauerkraut and mushrooms. Mm. Uh, so I remember just sitting with my grandmother and making hundreds of dumplings because, as you know, it's just there's no point to prepare all the filling and dough and make just twenty. You just sit down and make you make hundreds. With your, with your friends, with your family. Um, so I remember us sitting in the kitchen making them. And then <laughs> I've always, I've always asked, I, I, I used to ask my grandmother to make me just the, the, the edge of the, of the, of the dumpling, <laughs> that half circle dough, uh, because I was a child and I didn't like that sauerkraut taste. Mm. Uh, but instead, instead of that, she used to make me pasta because it is pasta, right? Pasta yeah, dough. Yeah, absolutely. Ne yeah. But it and never tasted the same. No. <laughs> I just wanted that half, half circle edge of the, of the, of the, of the, of the, of the dumpling. <laughs> oh, um, yeah, absolutely. That's great. Um, I, I am now just, just to carry on with what we're doing here. I'm now adding quite a lot of parsley, and I know that Carolina's mum, I hope she's not watching, um, really doesn't like parsley in the filling, but me and Carolina really do, so I'm going to add that. And most important is that I've added uh, all the lots and lots and lots of pepper, as you can see on the recipe board there. Um, and that is really so that it goes really well with the mushrooms. Just mixing that all together, and you just leave it to cool on the side. There, perfect. Does it look okay, Carolina? Any tips? It looks great, and as you said, black pepper and parsley, that's the perfect combination with mushrooms. Yeah, brilliant, so brilliant. It looks great. 
Fantastic. So next step is I'm going to move on to the dough. And with the dough, you've got to have plain flour. So we're going to do 250 grams of plain flour. And again, if you're going to double them and make 100 pierogies <laughs> like, like Carolina's grandmother, then do 500 grams or maybe even a kilo of flour. <laughs> then to the flour, you're going to add a pinch of salt. So we're moving on to here, the pinch of salt, and we're moving down the board. Add it, and I'm just going to mix it through. to get an even spread. Next, now, two different types of fat. You can do, ooh, let me just grab this one, butter. Uh, you can do 30 grams of butter to 250 grams of plain flour. Um, but you're in our cookbook as actually as well, we've made the recipe vegan, so you can use around about two tablespoons of oil, isn't it, Carolina? Yeah, yeah, not more. Yeah, I think when you use butter, you use a bit, bit more of fat. But when you mm -hmm. use oil, it it would be uh, two, two tablespoons, not more. Mm -hmm. Great. So I'm just adding the butter, and you just mix it around to kind of resemble breadcrumbs. I'm just going to move that bowl out of the way so you can see, and then. We add, now this is a bit of a contentious issue, the water. So uh, 100 millilitres of water. Now this is really interesting. When we were doing the um, recipes for the cookbook, um, we collected all the different recipes from all the women that we work with, all our students over the years. And Carolina and myself also gave a couple of recipes for the cookbook to share our stories and our experiences. When it actually got down to writing the recipes, what was quite interesting is that We'd all gotten the recipes, as Carolina said, from her grandmother, me, I'd learned it from about various different people and I pulled one recipe together. The women, they'd, um, they'd learned it either through YouTube or like on a TV program and maybe they'd adapted it for their kids. So when it came to how much or how little, people just didn't know. It was quite a funny experience. and. Our editor, Jazz, who, who kindly helped us edit all the recipes and make them more accessible for people to read, was having a bit of a nightmare because she couldn't understand, like, at what point do we go over the top, what handful, and, and different pinches, depending on who, you know, which hands you have. So we were really, really lucky enough to have some amazing uh, voluntary uh, recipe testers who were then able to kind of test the recipes a couple of times and then, um, you know, refine it a little bit. So with Carolina's recipe, we came up with 100 mils, but Carolina says... <laughs> uh, well, I think, uh, yeah, 100 or 125, but I just keep adding the water till I feel the, that, that the dough is right. Yeah. So just don't pour uh, all at once because then you might have a problem. It might be too wet. Yeah, but absolutely. As Claire is doing, just a little bit and check and check and check again. And I think yeah. this is it. I mean, we, we mentioned it, didn't we, in our, in our introduction of the cookbook, that these recipes are really kind of serving as a document or a kind of record of people's experiences and stories and processes of cooking, rather than actually the kind of very specific quantities themselves. So they are really yours to make. Um, you can just basically make them a couple of times, make some adjustments as we have done with, with Carolina's mum's recipe um, and just make them your own really. Cooking should be fun, it should be an enjoyable experience and really it should be about kind of communicating and engaging with the people around you, perhaps the ones who maybe gave you the recipe or the ones that you're then going to show how to make. So Carolina actually showed me how to make these ages ago, didn't you? Yeah, and 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 do you remember we used to you, we used to use oil, uh, and this is what my mum does. But uh, 
recently, maybe maybe a year ago, I I found that recipe using butter. And for me, this is just amazing. It, it, it changed everything. And I think, yeah, it's, it's, uh, the dough is much better. Have you told so, your mum yet? How's she taken yes, the news? Yes. Uh, no, no. Still well. using oil. She doesn't even want to try. <laughs> Seriously? Yeah, yeah. Oh, dear. She thinks her, her dough is perfect with, uh, with oil. So that's fine. <laughs> So ideally you want to, with the Carolina's new dough, as she said, with butter or with oil, you can put in the fridge and refrigerate for up to 30 minutes. That is the best kind of consistency. But if you don't have time, it's absolutely fine. You can just knead away, just as I'm doing right now. And as Carolina mentioned before, when she was talking about her grandmother, that it's quite similar to pasta dough. So you'll notice the consistency is quite similar. And I'm just going to be kneading this through. It's really interesting. We actually, this is one of the first recipes that we teach the women. When we bring uh, our classes around Levensium, uh, Longsight, we've done up in Cheatham Hill now as well. One of our first sessions is Carolina will teach them how to make this pierogi because the dumpling is a really, really, really important part of our project. And I think, Carolina, don't they... How's the reception with your food? Do they do they enjoy your food? <laughs> uh, you have to remember that the Polish food is a bit bland. We just use, uh, in terms of spices, we use uh, salt and pepper, and maybe marjoram if you want to go crazy. <laughs> but um, so you know, comparing to uh, Asian food, it might be a bit bland. So can you imagine the session when we've got many women from Africa, from Middle East, from, I don't know, South Asia, they, uh, they, <laughs> they think that the Polish food is, is very healthy, first of all, because we boil things. We, 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 we tend to boil everything, even sausages. So they think it's healthy. Once I, uh, I remember uh, uh, I was demonstrating how to make uh, beetroot soup with some little dumplings inside. So the women were saying, yes, it's very healthy. It's like a hospital food. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> yeah. So that was, that was quite funny. Um, and I, I kind of agree with them that it's a little bit bland. And uh, we don't have that, all those amazing, uh, strong... Uh, flavors like in Asian food yes but yeah I think yeah I think yeah it's different definitely it's different <laughs> so I'm actually going to come back to that because there is something really quite interesting there about why actually even though the women found quite a lot of differences with the way that the food was cooked there's quite a lot of similarities actually in the way that it was made but just before we do talk about that we actually uh, have this big wide rimmed glass here and you just want to, I've rolled out just a, just a piece of the dough. So I've actually broken the dough into three parts and I've rolled it out. And then I'm just going to cut out the dough like this and take off the, square, uh, the circle. And with a spoon, and some tray here. Just going to spoon the sauerkraut into. Oh, this is the this is the crucial bit. Making sure that none of the sauerkraut sticks out. Caroline will explain why in a minute. And then you just want to pinch closed the dough. Don't, if you're just starting off first time, don't worry about any fancy shapes just yet. Don't want to run before we can walk. <laughs> and then we have our first pierogi. Well, not pierogi, but pierog. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, one is this... pierog. <laughs> one, one pierog, right. Okay. One. So, Actually, quite a lot of people say pierogi, right? As for one. Yes. Uh, yes. 
uh, yeah, that's quite a common mistake. So pierogi is already plural. So many pierogi, you don't add S, you don't do pierogis. Mm. Pierogi is plural. One is pierog, singular is pierog. So, I love yeah. how the language changes, you know, over the kind of, over the different waves of migration. And then when people come over to the UK, they change the language and how they use it, right? Yeah, but I think this is kind of, you can compare that to, I don't know, like trousers. It's already, yeah, plural, yeah. Or furniture. Yeah. yeah, you don't add S. So this is, it feels like that when you add S to plural. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear. Right, yeah, that's, that's, that's good, something I didn't know. Um, so, dumplings are actually really interesting because, as Carolina said, the women are, at first, they're a bit kind of like, will you boil them? Or what on earth? But actually, once we get to this stage, what we absolutely love is, is just this kind of realisation that, oh my gosh, I have the same um, in my family, in my culture. And it's really, really great. You start to see what we'll do is we normally give the dough over to um, the ladies and they, we just say, there's the filling, there's the dough, off you go. And they just get so into it. We've seen incredible, incredible folds, like puli pitta, Bangladeshi folds. We've seen um, shish barak, kind of like a tortellini. We've seen jalza folds. We've seen like um, Afghani mantu folds. It's just been incredible to, to witness that for us and the volunteers that we work with as well. They learn just as much about other cultures as, as the learners learn about English and about the UK as well. So it's a really, it's a really, really kind of multi-way learning environment in this case. And we like that at Heart and Parcel. There isn't really any kind of hierarchy there. It's more to do with people coming in together into a, a shared space, what we call the third space, where People feel comfortable to share their skills, share their stories and experiences, but also develop their skills if they want to in a safe and kind of um, non-judgmental space. And it's really been amazing. The dumpling has represented that for us. Every single culture, every single culture has a dumpling or some kind of wrapped food. It's really, really interesting. The more women we've met, the more people we've met, we've realized that actually every single culture has that has that kind of wrapped food and that kind of starts the conversation because our sessions aren't really about food i know that sounds weird to say but it starts off so food is kind of the springboard or the, the kind of starting the entry point into kind of further ways of learning further ways of of understanding people and and places and cultures and motivations and aspirations as well. And we found that that's been really, really amazing. Quite a lot of the women, right, Carolina? Quite a lot of the women don't actually want to cook sometimes. Yeah, yeah, they, some of them, they, and I totally understand, they say, we cook every day. We don't want to come to your session and, and cook again, but we want to come to the session, meet people, talk about food, try different kinds of food. Yeah, and being that, as you said, the third space that, safe uh, environment. Mm. Yeah, definitely, definitely. So it's almost about, I mean, we've been running our online sessions now as well, so it's slightly different. The women that we work with don't tend to have exactly the same amount of contact or um, kind of um, engagement with the food, but we still have that community. We have like a WhatsApp group where everyone shares their recipes and stories in there. They practice English. And it's brilliant. I actually um, had a chat with some of the learners last week to see how they were getting on. And they said, yeah, we've made friends. We now talk with each other outside the WhatsApp group. And these are people who have lived in Manchester for a couple of years or some people who have newly arrived. And they're already making that connection just through the class. And so it's kind of entry point, a starting point. And then we've had learners with us for, I think I spoke to Aklima last week. She's been with us for four years now. And I asked her, because Aklima, I don't know, Carolina, if you remember, but Aklima <laughs> didn't usually like cooking. She liked to watch and she liked to eat, but she loved it because of the friends that she made. And she's an incredible photographer. So then she was able to work with us and, and kind of go a bit further and take photos for us, take photos of the session. So it's about kind of what do you want out of the session? You make it what you want, um, which was a kind of direct reaction to some of the provision that we experienced when we were working in the community sector 
we found that quite a lot of the provision wasn't very, I don't know, it wasn't, just wasn't very um, personal and wasn't very fitted to the individual's needs. And so by using cooking as a kind of starting point, we're then able to start that conversation and take things a little bit further. And uh, do you remember uh, when we were doing the session uh, in Levens Levensium at um, Inspire, and I was uh, teaching women how to make Polish uh, dumplings. And there was a woman, I think she was from um, Pakistan. Mm. And uh, so she was there when I was teaching the women. She, le uh, she learned how to do it. And then the next week she came and she said, okay, I use your dough, but I put minced chicken uh, inside yeah. and my, my own spices. And mm -hmm. it was great. My family loved that. And uh, yes, this is what, what you were talking about. The women come and they take uh, whatever they feel they want from the session and adapt uh, the, 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 the tastes and the food to their own, to their own taste. Yeah, Absolutely. And, uh, and this is what she did. And it was amazing. And I think also, um, you know, the dumplings are like, yeah, you can put whatever you want <laughs> in, yeah. in inside. It's like a pizza, yeah? You put whatever you want, whatever you have on the top. The same with the dumpling. You can fill it with whatever you want. Absolutely. It's so versatile. It's so nourishing. There's just, you know, it, it, you can make it what you want, which is why we kind of started with heart and parcel as kind of, the dumpling represented the kind of hidden experiences and rich stories that quite a lot of women and migrant communities bring with them to the UK, but they're not necessarily recognised. And so it was really, really great to actually um, kind of un unpack that and try to, to kind of tease that out and um, to allow the stories to unfold in a kind of safe and relaxed space and to actually have them to make the food their own. It was really quite amazing to have that experience. So how, how are they looking, Carolina? What do you think? Any tips? Uh, they look uh, great from here, but I want to make sure that you close them properly. <laughs> That's, I'm obsessed about it. And when, uh, when we're doing our sessions, I'm also obsessed and double check with every single one because if they are not closed properly or you've got a piece of sauerkraut sticking out of them, then they will open mm. uh, in a pan when you boil them and they will be ruined. Okay. Uh, so yeah, this Good double know. check if, uh, if they are properly, properly pinched, properly closed. Yeah. Brilliant. Oh, don't they look wonderful? I'm actually quite proud of myself. <laughs> Normally you do them and I'm, yeah, this is, this is not as bad as I thought they were going to look. They it's look beginner's great. luck, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> so I've got, been boiling a pot of water for quite some time. And to that, you want to add some salt, which I've already done. And you also want to add some oil to make sure that those pierogi absolutely do not stick together. Because when they stick together, what do they say in Poland, Karolina? They remember. are married. We don't want, we don't want <laughs> pierogi to get married in, in a pan, yeah? <laughs> remember. Amazing. I love it. I love it. So, yeah, it's just coming to the boil now. And... How long would you say they need to cook? So, uh, yeah, you've got the boiling water. And remember, for pierogi to not get married, first, don't pack the pan with, with, with them, like many of them. Not, uh, yeah, so I, I, I would say five, six max, maximum for the mm -hmm. pan like that. And then, and then the oil will help with, with that as well. Okay. So, uh, boiling water, once they are up, uh, I think three minutes, three, four minutes, four minutes, I would say, yeah. Okay. Uh, because remember, the, uh, the filling is already cooked. Right. Uh, so, it's only about the, about the dough. Okay. Yeah. Great. That's really good to know. So, I'm just waiting for it to get quite bubbling. Yeah. Do you, think, do you think they're okay to pop in, Caroline? It's kind of like half bubbling. Hmm. What is should I wait for a little bit? <laughs> you can't see that, can you? Yeah. What I'm going to do then is I'm going to start on the chikva. Um, so with the chikva, we have 
our cooked beetroot. So I've got that right here. You can actually, um, if you have raw beet, if you're lucky enough to have a garden and you grow it on your own, you can actually um, put it in the oven. Is that right, Caroline? And put it for 40 minutes to kind of roast gently? Yes, that's the, uh, that's the best way. I think you've got all the flavor there when you, when you wrap them in a foil and put them into the oven. Mm. Great. And then uh, we have lemon and granulated sugar and horseradish. But in order to save time, we have the horseradish in a jar that you can get from any good Polish shop. Um, and I think this one has sugar and salt and other things, Carolina. Oh, I can't hear you. All right. So yeah, you uh, you can uh, buy them in uh, Tesco's as well, uh, in a in a Polish section. So this one is just grated um, grated horseradish and mixed with water, sugar, vinegar, apple vinegar, salt, lemon juice, and oil. Mm. So still very strong, um, but it's not a it's not like a it's not pure horseradish. This is what I mean. Yes, okay. So, but it's quite easy to get in a shop, isn't it? Yes, and even in like Asda or Tesco, yeah, mm -hmm. you've got Great. those sections and they are there. And of course, Polish shops again. Fantastic, yeah. fantastic. So, what I've just done there is I've just grated the beetroot with a small side of the grater there. And to that, I'm going to add, um, I'm thinking this is why we didn't really give the quantities on the board because it really is, again, a tasting game. I'm just going to use. Uh, half a lemon and going to squeeze that in don't worry too much about the pips and to that then we have build up your kind of different flavors so you've got your sour there and I'm going to add in my sweet. I'm going to maybe put one teaspoon, do you reckon? So yes, and, and again, it depends uh, what you like. If you like sweet, you put more sugar. If you like spicy, more horseradish uh, sauce. When you like uh, sour, more lemon juice. So you can play with, uh, with the flavors here. Right. right, yeah. So just keep on tasting as you're going. I think that's always... A good, a good rule of thumb with any kind of um, cooking, isn't it? <laughs> so yeah. I've just added the pierogi now to the pan. The water's been boiling. And as Carolina said, around three minutes there. I'm just going to finish off. So I've added the lemon, the sugar. And finally, oh, I love, I love this horseradish so much. This is just such a great accompaniment to the pierogi just really sweet almost like a relish right like a nice yeah. chutney or pickle you know yeah this is we 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 use that for 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 like roasted meat as well uh and this is again very christmasy side mm. yeah it does look very christmasy as well <laughs> yeah so yeah. Just yeah that up on the side here And I'm just going to add a little dollop of extra horseradish. And I'm going to pop a little bit of parsley there. And so with the heart and parcel, we don't just make the food in the lesson and then leave it. We try to take the learning beyond the classroom. So what we do actually is, um, we mentioned that the women actually start to get interested with their food and kind of creating their own dishes. And after the first couple of sessions, they were all really, really wanting to kind of um, get going really. They said, you kept coming up to us and saying, oh, can we cook our dish? Can we, um, can we show you how to make our food? So we actually decided to just let that happen. And so we now run <laughs> learner-led sessions where a lot of the women will create their own menus, their own dishes, their own food. They'll work out um, a plan supported by myself and Carolina. And we'll actually do it together. 
and they'll demonstrate their dish from start to finish. Um, sometimes in the class, sometimes actually in open events or workshops and training. And it really is such an amazing way to take the learning beyond the classroom. The learners are developing their presentation skills, their English language skills, and also the public are learning a bit more about the different foods that are available on, you know, right in their communities in Manchester. In Manchester, we have such a rich um, tapestry of lots of different foods, and it's just been so amazing to experience that through the ladies we, we work with, really. Um, Caroline, I don't know if you want to say anything on that. How have you found the supper clubs? Which has been your best one? Sorry, I was just replying to, uh, to a question on, um, which is kind of related on our, on our uh, chat. Oh, great. Ben, ben actually asked uh, if there are any, uh, ever any struggles for certain ingredients. Ah, uh, good question. Uh, yeah. Thanks, ben. Uh, because UK is so multicultural that, uh, yeah, it, it shouldn't be, but sometimes it is. And I, I, when I think about Polish, uh, Polish food, I think when it comes to the fresh vegetables, fresh fruits, meat, that, that's the problem for me. Even, um, yeah, if some bread made here in uh, Polish bread made in, in, in Manchester, in a, a British um, bakery, it doesn't taste the same. It never does, does it? It never does. Well, I think uh, when it comes to, uh, you know, like jars and cans, they are, uh, they are brought from Poland, so that's fine. They are Polish products. But, uh, yeah, when it comes to fresh ingredients, uh, yeah, I, sometimes it can be a problem. It is getting better though, Ben, as well, because actually we found that over the years when we've been doing our, um, our lessons, we've been finding quite a lot of the interesting ingredients that the women will ask for. And at first we'll say, oh, no, we have, definitely don't have that. And then we'll be able to find it in a shop. So I think, you know, Britain's shops are changing the demands depending on who's, you know, which communities are around them. So I think, yeah, we found quite a lot of surprising ingredients that we thought previously we wouldn't normally find. So... So yeah, um, right guys, whilst Carolina was answering the question, I've actually plated it up and what we do normally to finish this off is we would drizzle with some melted butter or oh, if you're vegan, just leave this one out. And <clears throat> I think I'm going to add, I've got some onions here from earlier that I fried. You just fry that in a little bit of butter or oil until they're nice and crispy. <clears throat> and finally, always, 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 always got to have that parsley there over the top. And I think I'm done. Judge Carolina, can you give me your verdict? looks amazing are you sure you're not just saying that because yeah. there's like loads of people watching no uh i i guess because you are much more creative than me so your presentation is always better than mine but not sure about the taste <laughs> we'll see we'll see, we'll see. <laughs> um listen i hope that um oh i've left a pierogi in the pan that can be for me. Um, I hope that um, everyone who's been watching has, has felt like they've learned something new, um, either through the actual food or any of the conversation that we've had tonight. Um, we also have the recipe up here. I hope you've managed to catch that through there. If you have any questions, please do email us or you can tweet at us or, or send us a message on Facebook if you're not quite sure about any of the ingredients. Um, and thank you very much for watching. I guess we're gonna take it to any questions now. Um, to Zosha if she has any questions from the live chat or anything else uh, to say whilst I eat. Hello, I'm back. Um, so they they look fab. Um, I'm quite jealous that you get to eat them and we don't um, <sighs> because if we would have been able to do this event as planned. We'd all be tasting them now. Um, so fingers crossed we can in the future um, and also thank you Claire for cooking them while it's so hot as well <laughs> I know oh my gosh can you imagine how hot it is in here at the moment 
boiling. I'm I'm boiling just sat here watching. So, <laughs> um, so there is a question in the live chat from Ben that says, um, apart from the pierogi, what are your favourite dishes that um other people have brought to you, um, mm. through the sessions or other ones that you've made? Oh my lessons? gosh, that is really amazing. Um, really kind of quite a big question actually. We, Carolina. <laughs> Well, for me, um, I was uh, I was really impressed uh, with Shish Barak Syrian Syrian dish, uh, which contains uh, really tiny dumplings uh, with the lamp filling, and uh, and you eat that with the yogurt sauce so they are dipped in a yogurt sauce so for me that combination lamb and yogurt uh together and um yeah we've got in poland the really tiny dumplings as well so i was really surprised to see them in a different uh yeah totally different setting and 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 uh i i've never even thought that uh, syria such a far away country can have such a similar similar dumpling so, I think um, I agree with Carolina. Yeah. It's it's less about like our favorite dishes and it's just more about the amazement of just how similar everything is. And once we pass that barrier, it's just oh, the conversation just gets so fun and interesting in our sessions because we're all then sharing ideas about how to like fold the dough and knead it and lots of different tips and cooking techniques. Yeah, that's been really, really good. Oh, that sounds sounds fun. A lot of fun. How are they tasting? Mm. They are absolutely delicious, really, really good. Um, I've also tasted the vegan ones as well from our cookbook, and they're really, really delicious as well. So, so yeah, you could do both ways. Um, and we've got another question on the chat from Leon um, that says um, that they love your cookbook. Um, how can people get involved and support what you do with Heart and Parcel? Oh, thank you so much, Leon. That's really, really lovely. Um, you can get involved in, in quite a few different ways. Um, you can volunteer with us. Um, so at the moment, we've, we're kind of full on the volunteers um, because we're doing online sessions and we've already got our online moderators. But um, you can also email us if you're a charity or a project or you're a restaurant or you're in the food industry, email us and, and have a chat and let's see how we can work together. Um, we also run um, training events or workshops. Um, we've worked with different schools before as well. Um, and we've also worked with um, actually quite corporate events, right, Carolina, doing training? Yeah. <laughs> so with yeah. Boaz Trust and uh, we ran a training day for their volunteers and we uh, showed them recipe from start to finish. So, yeah, in lots of different levels, um, you can read more about us on our website and get involved um, with the research that we're doing, um, looking into different types of food, um, different um, migrant communities in Manchester as well. And yeah, just buy the cookbook and um, you can all the funds from this cookbook go yeah. straight back into the project to generating more English language provision and um, work uh, with the women that we work with. Um, Sosha, can I talk about the event next year? Um, yeah, you... yeah, I was going to, I was, I was going to ask more about the cookbook. Um, mm, please do. Just to ask, because I know this recipe is in the cookbook, but there's lots of others in the cookbook and just ask about that process of putting the cookbook together and what it kind of involved. Yeah, so the cookbook was a really, really um, interesting process. We actually um, decided to do this cookbook from a conversation with the learners that we worked with. They all loved the English classes speaking and cooking, but um, what they were kind of craving or needing for their everyday life, the GP, filling out forms for their kids at school, was writing. So we actually put on a writing project called Cook, Eat, Write, Share where women would bring a recipe with them from their memories, from their stories, and we'd lead them through the 10 weeks and learn how to write that recipe plus a story. Um, it ended in an open workshop and also the recipes then went into the cookbook. The women thought, you know, what's the next, you know, uh, natural step is to actually have everything accumulated into this kind of book where everything, we've got all the stories of the women 
and we have the recipes here. And this process was really interesting because you can see this book is actually a very, very high spec, very, very high quality. And the reason for that is we worked with lots of very professional and amazing creatives, actually. We worked with Minute Works. Um, they're a, a designer duo, uh, Jimmy and Dom, amazing people. And they have very, very strong ethic with their company. Um, and they designed, got all the paper and designed um, all the different prints that you can see there. And they also helped with the different um, breaks there. And then we also had a fantastic photographer, Beck Lupton, Rebecca Lupton, who went round to all the different women's houses. And she um, actually went and sat with them and took photos with them all the way through from start to finish. Her approach, her style is really, really human. She kind of, she's very, very interested in portrait. Um, and she also did wonderfully with the food as well. Um, there and then finally we had um, Jasmine uh, from down in London who used to work for Ocado Life magazine and so she actually helped us edit the recipes just made them more readable so actually the stories there are completely verbatim from the women nothing was changed but then here she's changed them around to make them accessible for everybody I mean there's so much more we can talk about with with the process of it because that was all these different creators working together we self-published it as well and we had our own book launch as well um, but I think we're going to be doing uh, a bigger talk about that in more detail with the designers with the editor and with the photographer and some of the women that we work with cooking as well that's going to be next year at People's History Museum I don't know when Zosha no, um, we need to have a look because obviously we've been reshaping our programme plans at the moment as we're closed. So um, we're looking at when we might be able to host that in the building because I think everyone will agree actually tasting the food and sharing the food is probably quite an important part of understanding um, what people have in common in terms of the dumplings and those different recipes, but also how people have kind of come together to kind of put that cookbook together um, from all different backgrounds as well is really really interesting and was a really kind of important part of the event so absolutely, yeah. for absolutely. Next year. <laughs> does anyone have any more questions um there aren't any more questions in the chat um but a final question from me was going to be what what's the future for heart and parcel are you going to expand your online sessions have kind of gone nationwide across the country and across the world but obviously yeah. what physical lessons return, you're very much Manchester based and yeah, just kind of, what are your future plans? Um, well, I'll start a bit and if Carolina, if you want to add, that would be great. Um, but yeah, so we started the online classes, which have just been amazing. And that's just allowed us to give a much wider reach to the learners that we've initially started off with. But then it's also given a really nice kind of um, shone the spotlight on Manchester as well. So the online sessions, well, every week I cook a different dish from the cookbook and I really kind of platform the recipe and explain the women behind the stories. And that's kind of given a lot of the learners a bit more context of Manchester and like the food that you find here. So that's been really amazing. And we've branched out to so many different learners now. We've also got a podcast that we've been doing. So it's called Tastes of Life. And... Um, in this new series, which was um, sponsored by the Greater Manchester Mental Health Service, the NHS, I interviewed seven of the women who attended that online uh, class the last month. And I talked to them about their lives in lockdown, um, how food is related to them in, through lockdown, their stories. I've never met them before as well, which is a really amazing experience for me and for them, I imagine, talking to their teacher over Zoom. But um, that's going to be coming out in the next couple of weeks. And then from there, oh yeah, the next couple of weeks on Spotify or on YouTube and Apple Podcasts as well. <laughs> and um, then for the future, we're going to hopefully, we've been moving towards learner-led projects and we really, really want to kind of take a bit more of a step back. Um, and one of our, our ideas is to change our structure of our projects somewhat so that the learners are really at the forefront of what we do. Um, rather than us teaching all the time. And so we're hoping to branch out into different areas in Manchester, but also possibly, you know, in different cities as well. That's kind of our idea, our plan. Caroline, I don't know if you want to add any more to that. Well, I think you, you, you cover everything. I just wanted to say that 
that online thing uh, because of COVID opened like new doors for us. We, our thing was just the physical sessions. We've never even thought about that online session. And this is just working great. And, and it, I think it surprised us a lot. And, and I think we're gonna, of course, we, we will not, never abandon our, our, our physical uh, sessions, but I think we will continue the online sessions uh, because yeah, we can reach so many, so many people this way and i think that's 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 the future definitely it's been, and it's student been, yeah sorry you go on yeah the student-led uh, project this is what is very important for us as you said and uh uh yeah so and we always listen to our students and listen what they want to do so this is so we don't yeah I think the future will show what is needed and and uh, which direction should we should go for. I think that's a really important point that you ended on there, Carolina, because actually every single step of the way has been as a result of this kind of breathing space between each project. We work on a project by project basis, sometimes because the resources are limited, but also that's the way the funding works sometimes. And after each project, we sit down with the learners, with the volunteers, with the staff, and we really reflect and respond to what we've seen, what has come out of the sessions. It's really kind of a very, very like organic um, approach to the way that we, we, we manage our projects. And then we react to that. So where we've gotten to now is as a result of what the women have wanted, what our clients, what our users have wanted over the years. And I, I, I hope this is, this is what we will continue to do in the future. We've got quite a lot of learners who are really, really already done amazing things with us, done supper clubs, hosted um, catering, um, done talks, presentations, workshops. We've had absolutely fantastic um, We've had Hanan, our wonderful um, learner, who's turned into a learner coordinator, a volunteer, and she's just been amazing and has actually been working with us in lots of different capacities as well. So it's been really great to see the learners kind of develop what they want out of it, actually, and how they wished for, for our project to go. We, we kind of, it's a bit cheesy, but we like to say it's like a big family. Everyone who comes into it, volunteers, staff, learners, it's just one big family. Growing, constantly growing, growing. yeah, growing family. <laughs> <laughs> so many mouths to feed. <laughs> really exciting plans for the future and expanding. Um, so, yeah, well, um, so we've not got any more questions. So I just want to say a huge thank you to Claire and Carolina for sharing this evening with us, um, and yeah. their pierogi recipe. And again for Claire cooking in the seat. Um, and thank, thank you everyone you. for joining us as well. Um, as I said, um, yeah, we're really hoping we can do this as a physical event um, at the museum so we all get to taste the food. Mm. Um, please do check out our other online events. Um, we've got an upcoming um, Radical Late Night with um, Petra Kucha Manchester, which is on the theme of migration. Um, and yeah, that's, that's so the 9th of July. Um, and all, our deta all the details for that are on our website and social media accounts. Um, and also People's History Museum is still working really hard to bring people together to inspire hope and positivity in action during this time. Um, and even though our buildings closed and several important sources of income are in affected, um, our works really never felt so relevant in terms of bringing these kind of projects to you. Um, so if you are able to support us either by making a donation or joining our Radicals campaign or just sharing our online content, please do. Um, and finally, just a reminder, um, to like and subscribe our channel and also go over to Heart and Parcels channel as well um, and like and subscribe there and um, because you'll get to receive updates of their online videos and classes so yeah that'd yeah. be great yeah. thanks so much Sosha for having us it's been really fun tonight thank you thank, thank you, you. Thank <laughs>